you very much. OK, um, so first things first, the, um, it was brought to my attention today by two people that if you just buy the student edition of MATLAB, that doesn't come with the signal processing toolbox, which is where you get the freak Z function. So that was an oversight on my behalf. The good news is, is that um, you can buy it, the, that toolbox for, I think it's $30. So it's pretty cheap. You have to go to the MathWorks website. MathWorks is the people who make um, MATLAB. I'll, I'll post it on Blackboard, the link. But you have to go and then make a profile for yourself. And in doing so, you identify that you're a student uh, using this for academic purposes. And then that's what entitles you to the, the discount of, of $30. Uh, but you should download it off the site. And I actually called MathWorks today and verified that even if you bought the there won't be any license issues with wherever you got your student edition from. If you just download the toolbox, it should work. So, but yeah, you'll need that for the freak Z command and, and for a number of the other ones that we're going to be using in, in uh, the weeks to come. It's signal processing toolbox. Good question. Um, that's also a good question. I don't, I think so, but don't hold me to that. How's that for non-committal? Vague. You'll find right one way or another. We'll, we'll get to the bottom of it. Um, okay. So, any questions from the reading before we jump in? If we if we at least list them now, I may decide to, to punt the question for you know till later. But I guess you know, can we start with? Is there any? Okay. Well, we're gonna go through those almost you know, sort of like one by one, but. Um, anything sort of conceptual or anybody want to take a hack at explaining the continuous time Fourier transform in their own words? That's a tricky one. That's pretty much it. You're mapping what? So you have a continuous. You're, you think of it like a box, right? Like a, I like to think of, um, I like to think of like a, you know, a function where you put in, um, let me just get this to come up. So, one way to think about it is, um, let's get the right toolbar up. So, you know, you have, um, you have a box with your, Continuous time Fourier transform. Okay, so in you have your time function, right? And what comes out? Exactly, x of f. So we'll. So this is capital X or cursive X. We'll do it differently, right? Whatever. Um, you have a continuous signal going in. What do you have coming out? Is it continuous or discrete? Continuous. Okay. So it's like saying that you've got a, you're essentially trying to find the frequency, the, the, you're trying to find the strength of the signal at each frequency. Right? That's what the Fourier transform is. Another way to think about it is that you're mapping your, your, you're mapping your time signal onto the, um, onto the complex base e to the minus j omega t. Right? So essentially you're saying, how much, so omega is, um, actually, so the book, the book has a convention that's opposite to what I'm accustomed to. They use, they use capital omega for continuous frequency, right, which is actually, and they use lowercase omega for discrete frequency, which is the opposite of the way I learned. So I probably make a few mistakes along the way. Um, right, but essentially the idea is that you're trying to find what, the strength is of your signal at each one of these complex frequencies, okay? And that strength doesn't necessarily have to just be a real number, right? It could be, it could be an imaginary number. It could be a complex number. Um, but to me, the most important thing is to notice that what you wind up with is a continuous function of frequency, right? Now, how about the discrete time Fourier transform? What's that all about? What goes in? Discrete frequency. 
discrete sequence. That's what I need. Okay. So it's discrete in. How about out? What comes out? Right. So that's sort of what's a bit tricky about this. And um, so you, you put in a, a discrete signal. What comes out is a continuous signal. So we'll call it um, x as a function of e to the, I think the book uses e to the j omega. Um, and again, omega being a continuous function. Right, so these are both, you know, the, when you're looking at the frequency, it's bo in both cases you're, you're saying, well, this is a continuous function of, uh, of frequency. So you're starting with something that's discrete, but in essence you're saying it's got energy at an infinite number of frequencies, which is a bit counterintuitive, right? You could start with five points, right, five discrete points, and run it through whatever this, this magical function, and now you have, you're finding it's got energy at an infinite number of, uh, frequencies, which is unusual. Um, what we'll learn about next week is sort of like the little brother of the discrete time Fourier transform. This is just to sort of put you in the frame of mind of what comes next. Um, is just the discrete Fourier transform. And that one is discrete in, discrete out. Right. So, and next week we'll learn how you go from the discrete Fourier transform Sorry, we'll learn how you go from the discrete time Fourier transform to the discrete Fourier transform. I suspect a lot of people have probably seen it before, but you know we'll do it again. Um, um, so that's next time. Next week. All right, questions so far? We're doing good. Um, okay, so my third question: How are they similar, and how are they different? There's more than one answer, so I'm sort of happy to entertain, um, you know, any thoughts. Okay, so let's all right. So you think so? The, the discrete time Fourier transform you tell me is periodic. Okay, does everyone agree with that? Okay, and you're saying the period is? Okay, always? Yeah, absolutely right. Okay, so the DTFT, always periodic, always 2 pi. Remember last time we talked about how there's this magical periodicity of 2 pi. Remember we talked about uh, discrete frequency, and it always went from minus pi to pi, and that once you get to pi, then, then your, your signal's essentially at the sampling rate, so then after that it's sort of back to where you started. This magical 2 pi that always keeps appearing and reappearing. Um, good. So what about the um, continuous time Fourier transform? Is that periodic? No. No. So that's not periodic. Right. It just it goes on to infinity, right? So what, what range of, when we talk about discrete time Fourier transform, what are the range of frequencies that we're typically interested in? Okay. Why those frequencies? Why not zero to two pi? <laughs> yeah, it's mostly it's by convention, right? And it, it, there it does have some some favorable mathematical properties. Yeah, I mean, you, you could say, I mean, you could use pi over 4 to, what is it, 5 pi over 4, is that right? You know, anything anything with it that's 2 pi would, would work. Um, yeah, mostly by convention. Um, whereas continuous time Fourier transform, it's really defined over, you know, minus infinity to infinity. So, um, so there's definitely a difference on, on that front. Let me see what, if I have anything else on my list. Um, All frequencies. Okay. Anything else? Yep. Um. Yeah. I mean, 
I sort of had two on my list. You could, I mean, we sort of already discussed it. One is that they both produce a continuous, a function of continuous in frequency. And the other is they're both estimating the frequency content of the, of the signal. So, um, so under similarity, we put both, both produce Okay, very good. So both produce a continuous function, and both, let's say, I'll say both can produce a complex function. Right, so in essence, um, sort of that's, you know, as grad students, you've probably already dealt with this and don't get as nearly as confused um, with this as undergrads do. But, but in essence, um, yeah, you're going to wind up, most of the time you wind up with complex, um, with a complex frequency content. So it's not just, you know, seven times what's at this frequency. It's usually, you know, some, some sort of a complex number. And um, unless, unless the signal has certain precise mathematical qualities, which we'll, which we'll talk about later, well, that, you know, under certain cases, you, it can just have a purely real or purely imaginary transform. But, but most of the time, it's, it's complex. So both can produce a complex function. Um, and both are involved in estimating frequency content. So both involve estimating frequency content. Good. Anything else? How do you mean? Sure, because you're taking is it periodic. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're actually, let me come back to that. We're going to talk about that. Um, did I ask a question about why the unwrap works? I did. We'll come, we'll come back to that. Yeah. So essentially, it's it's the the phase function isn't unique. Absolutely. Um, okay, that's good. I think we already answered question four, which was asking about the period. Um, what range of values do we use for the frequency? Yeah, it's always minus pi to pi. Um, but that's just by convention. Um, okay. Before we jump on, um, I want to do a example. So. We're going to talk about um, signals, and we're going to talk about filters. So let me just make try to start by, by putting this distinction out here. So the signals versus filters. So the reason we need to even discuss this distinction in the first place is that we're going to talk about the frequency content of signals and the frequency content of filters. And they both use the same math. They both get cranked through the discrete time Fourier transform. So Conceptually, it's the same, but we just want to keep in mind that sometimes we're talking about a signal, which is something that represents information. So it could be an audio signal or a video signal or whatever, um, versus a filter, which is a sequence of numbers that represents a function that you would apply to a signal. So they're both, so, so filters are represented, at least in the digital domain, Filters are represented by a um, series of numbers. Um, so we can think of them like signals. Let's jot that down. So sometimes we'll talk about a low-pass filter, but we also might talk about a, a low-bandwidth signal, right? So it, in essence, we, we could be talking about the same thing because, like I said, a filter in the digital domain is just a string of numbers. Well, so is a signal. So it just, it's just a matter of what you do with that information. You either use it as a signal or use it as a filter. So 
Um, so let's just keep that concept in mind as we um, as we barrel ahead. So w the MATLAB example I want to do is we're going to look at two numbers. We're going to start by looking at um, oops, I don't want to do x. Let's call it h. So we're going to look at a function called h of n. So this is just a discrete sequence with just two numbers in it, right? So a half, a half. In fact, this is like a moving average filter with length 2. Okay? So the question is, is this a low frequency signal or a high frequency signal? And how can we figure that out? Um, so one option is, you know, we could actually plug this into the formula for the discrete time Fourier transform. We can get a closed form expression that we could plot. Um, and actually, that's not too hard to do with a signal like this because there's only two terms. You know, so you could actually plug it directly in and get a function of omega. Um, so we're trying. The question we're trying to answer is low or high frequency. Why do you say by inspection it's low frequency? That's absolutely correct. What we're going to find out is that it, it is, in fact, a low-frequency signal. Um, and that's good. That's actually a good segue. We can talk a little bit about where the intuition for that comes from. I think it's instructive to think about the intuition. Um, so just to recap what I was just saying before, before I talk about that, um, we have two options in terms of answering this question. Well, technically three. Number one is intuition, right? We can just try to eyeball it and guess, which is good. Number two is we could, we could actually plug into the DTFT function. Okay, there are good reasons and bad reasons for why we might want to do this. Um, or we could have MATLAB do the work. And I'm going to trust that everybody can plug, this, plug these numbers into the, the function for the discrete time Fourier transform and get a function of omega. That's... It's algebraically not the prettiest thing in the world, but it's not impossible. I mean, you, you can do that. I'm a little bit more interested in, in how to get MATLAB to do the work for us. Before we do that, let's talk about the intuition. Anytime you have a, if we think of this like a filter instead of like a signal, um, the, you know, filters are sort of set up to detect sequences in your signal that look just like the filter. So this filter is going to maximally respond when it res it's filtering a signal that has two adjacent samples that have exactly the same values. Okay. So for example, if I had the signal, let's say this was a filter. Right, so if this was a filter and I put in the signal 1,1, um, one, one, right, so I convolved my 1,1 one, one with the filter. I would get the biggest output that I possibly could, right? That would give me um, a half, one, a half. Okay, so I get this value of one, which is pretty big. So here, the shape of my signal has the same shape as my filter. Okay, so this is a low frequency signal. It didn't change, right? So in fact, here, the, 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 the uh, digital frequency is zero. So let's compare that with if we put um, a high frequency signal in, so one negative one. So here's a signal that changes a lot. Well, if we put that high frequency signal into the same filter, looks like we're going to get negative a half, zero, a positive a half. So you get that by, by doing the convolution. So in the first case, we put in a low frequency signal. We got an output of 1. We're essentially only going to look at the middle sample. We put in the high frequency signal. We got an output of 0. So that's because you know, all signals are, all filters are picked up are just by nature, just by the nature of the way the math works, that they're looking for signals that look like them. So in this case, this is a filter that's looking for low frequency signals, things that don't change from one sample to the next. So our intuition tells us it's low frequency. Question so far? Yeah. Um, I don't know how to get the output. That's 
Oh, I, I, do you know convolution? Yeah. yeah, I just convolved it. I just said, so for example, if you take 1, 1, and you convolve that with a half, a half, that should give you a half, 1, a half. So in other words, you do, the first half comes from, we'll learn more about you know, the convolution in the future, but if you've seen it already in another class, you, it should make some sense. Um, the first one half equals one times a half. Um, the one comes from, so then you shift it. So then it's one times a half plus one times a half. And then you, then you slide again. So now you have, to get the last number, it will be, um, do this. It'll be one times a half. So it's just a, it's just a convolution. Are people comfortable with convolution? Have we seen convolution? Yes, no? That should be something to bone up on if you haven't seen it in a while. D don't fret too much about this. Uh, this is just sort of like a little bit of an aside to see if we could pull some intuition out of this. And it'll actually come in handy for the next example. All right. Let's have MATLAB do the work first because, you know, as engineers, sort of half the fun is learning how to use the tools, right? We should, the intuition should guide us, but at the same token, you know, if you're going to solve everything by hand, you'll be there all day and you may you know, you make mistakes and whatnot. Um, okay, so I've written a little bit of code where we're going to investigate um, this first filter, which I'm called H1 in my code, and I'm just going to blank out the, the, the second part of the example uh, with H2. Let me just take that out so that we don't deal with it. Um, okay, so here's my signal H. Um, the core of what I'm going to do is use a freak Z command, right? And freak Z is essentially, it's MATLAB's version of the discrete time Fourier transform. Um, did anyone have a chance to play with this when they did the reading? Yeah. A little bit? Okay. So essentially you're going to give it three commands, right? It's got the first command, which in this case is just our filter. The one, so we always think of our signal or our filter as having a numerator and, and a denominator. You know, in the case when you just have a signal, it's like that you just imagine that the denominator is one. Because right? anything divided by one is just itself. So our signal is our numerator. We have a denominator of one. And then I want to specify the, um, the frequencies at which it gets evaluated. Right? So essentially, you know, we said that the, the Fourier transform is a continuous function. Right, but obviously MATLAB, MATLAB doesn't do continuous functions. We're essentially saying evaluate that continuous function at these frequencies, and I'm specifying the frequencies. Okay, so what did I use for omega? Has anybody used the lin space command before? So, okay. <laughs> um, Other way around. It gives you a vector between zero and pi. It gives you right. It gives you a thousand twenty-four evenly spaced points starting at zero and ending at pi, right, which is nice. It goes and it figures out how big to make the division between each point. Okay, great. So let me comment this out as well. All right. So now we're going to take the Fourier transform and then we're going to plot it. Um, Okay, so before I even run it, why is that a bad idea to plot H1? Exactly, right? H1, we're, we're anticipating that H1 is going to be complex. So you can't just tell MATLAB, plot a complex number. You, we, you have sort of two basic options. You can plot it as a um, rectangular function, in which case you plot the real part and then you plot the imaginary part, two separate plots. Or you can get it in polar. You can plot the magnitude in one plot and the phase in the other plot. But basically, you're stuck with two plots. OK, so this is a bad idea. Let's actually run the code and see if we can get MATLAB to complain about it. Um, did it complain? Yes. 
warning, imaginary part. So it, it sort of makes an assumption, and we don't really know what it did. So we're actually going to not put too much credence in this plot. Is this, is this, is this um, in this case, I think it, I think MATLAB's guess was to ignore the imaginary part. That's what it's telling you. So it just plotted the real part. Um, but it's it's generally considered to be sloppy form to do that because you want to always be in 100% control of what happens. And here you're, you're sort of letting MATLAB decide for you what, what gets picked. Okay. So we don't want to do this. This is lousy. Um, so let's plot it. Um, oh, I made a little function to do the plotting for me. So in other words, I send my omega and my h1 to a function which I call plot data. And plot data is essentially going to create two subplots for me. Uh, sorry, four subplots. I'm going to get the magnitude, phase in one row, and then the real and imaginary parts in the other row. So oops, let's run this. All right. So in the top row, we've got this um, function now in polar coordinates, right? We've got the magnitude and the phase. So, and on the bottom row, we've got the real part and the imaginary part. So looking at it as a, as a rectangular uh, function. <clears throat> okay, so let's pick this apart. Which one of these plots do I look at to say this is a high frequency or a low frequency signal? Debate. Right. Absolutely. Now, for the record, this shows the same information, but this turns out to be not be the one you want. When you're looking at um, when you're looking at whether it's a high frequency or a low frequency, you just want to look at the magnitude, right? just as you would with with com with uh, continuous time filters. So in this case, we're looking at the we just look at the frequency plot, sorry, the magnitude plot to determine if it's a high or low frequency. As predicted, the low frequencies get passed, the high frequencies get rejected. This is a low frequency signal or a low frequency filter, whichever way we want to think about it. Um, what can we say about the phase? Okay, that's right. That's all I wanted to point out about that. There's anytime your phase is linear like that, that's actually a very nice property for a filter to have. We call it linear phase. Uh, we'll come back and talk a bit more about that later. Um, the real and the imaginary bits are, to me, less useful. Whenever I do these filters, I like to put them in the frequency. Um, I like to look at them as, uh, as phases, as complex numbers in polar form. Um, there is some benefit to looking at them in, in terms of real and imaginary, especially when you're trying to determine if there are certain properties, which we will get to, I promise. Um, but you know, for the time being, they're, they're there just to show that you can, uh, that you can, that you can plot them either way. All right? Questions yet so far? All right. Um, let me jump back into the code now and look at my other option. Um, so the first one we did was H1. Now let's look at H2. Right. So based on our intuition, is this going to be a high or a low frequency signal? It's going to be high, right? Because essentially, it's looking for samples that, adjacent samples that change rapidly, right? Up from one sample and down the next. That's a big change from one sample to the next. All right, so, oops. So I'll uncomment all that and we'll create our plot. All right, so here's figure two. And sure enough, the magnitude plot shows us that this is a high frequency signal. What's going on with my x-axis? It's going from 0 to 1. Right. We're actually looking at frequency divided by pi. So in other words, instead of, OK, so it's hard to make a plot where you plot the axis and it looks neat and, and readable, where you have you know, pi over 2, pi. You know, it's, it's much easier to just divide the x-axis by pi and then label it as you know, 0, a quarter, a half, 3 quarters, 1. 
And then you know that I don't really mean the frequency is 1. I mean the frequency is 1 times pi. So that's just done to neaten up the plot. Um, and of course, I stopped at pi because my frequency goes from minus pi to pi. So here's a question. Um, I went from 0 to pi, but we talked before about um, the frequency should go from minus pi to pi. So what would happen if I changed this from minus to go from minus pi to pi? What would I see? This actually ties in with one of the other questions, um, which was asking if your signal is where am I? If your signal is purely real, this was question number six. What qualities might you expect a Fourier transform to have? So this is a kind of a cool question, right? So we just plotted zero to pi. What if I go back and I amend the plot now so it goes from minus pi to pi? What do you think we might expect? Which plots? All of them? Just the magnitude. Okay. Clearly, symmetry is going to come into this somehow, right? We've got to hash out how we might expect it to. Does anyone know what the property is for real, real signals? That what, what their DTFT is? Conjugate symmetry. Okay. Right. So that's worth jotting down. Um, where's my jotter? Um, all right. So uh, real digital sequences. Are oops have conjugate symmetric DTFTs. Cool. What does that mean? I agree. I just don't know what it means now. whole thing? There's a little more to this. What is the definition of conjugate symmetry? Um, exactly. That's sort of what I was, that's sort of what I was, I was uh, digging for there. Um, right, so we're right. It's conjugate symmetric. And the definition of conjugate symmetric is that the, so you write it like this, um, equals x of, where is it, x conjugate of e to the minus j omega. And in English, what that means is that the real part will be even. So the real part of x will be even. And the odd part, no, let's try that again. The imaginary part of x will be odd. Okay, let's give that a whirl, see if it works. So I am, all I have to do to change this, what do I do to change this now if I want to plot from minus pi to pi? I'm going to change one line of code. Okay, we seem to be in agreement there. All right, so I'm just going to change this from minus pi to pi. Hit the plot button. Okay, so here's my low pass signal. Sorry, this is the high pass signal. Uh, ignoring for a minute the top line, right? Conjugate symmetric didn't make, didn't presuppose anything about the polar form. It just talked about the real and imaginary part. But here you can see, as predicted, the real part is even. The imaginary part is odd. Okay? So that's good. All that really means is that if you know, if you knew that this was going to have this shape, and you know that it's a real sequence, you, you would know automatically what the negative frequencies would have to be. They would have to be even in this case and odd in this case. So 
other words, this has to define this. So the, the odd here, and vice versa for the even case. All right, so that was the, the high pass signal. Let's look at the low pass signal. All right, so same principle applies. Okay, the real part's even, the imaginary part's odd. Okay, questions? All right, what if I do this now? What if I make this, instead of from minus pi to pi, I make it from minus 2 pi to 2 pi? How the plot's going to change? Why? Exactly. Okay. So we know that it's periodic with period 2 pi. So let's see if I can do this. So from minus pi to pi, you know, we have one value. And then after that, it starts to repeat itself, right? So in other words, the, the segment that you see here would be the same as the segment you see here. Okay, it's just periodic with 2 pi. Right? And that doesn't matter. Real, imaginary, magnitude, angle, it's all the same, right? That, that's, every aspect of this has to be completely periodic with period 2 pi under all conditions. It doesn't matter what your signal is. Questions? All right, well, that's good. Um, let me see if I want to jump to my next example. Um, what, so I want to talk for a bit about question five, um, which if you don't have it in front of you anymore, it says, what are the practical limitations of the discrete time Fourier transform? Um, in other words, is there any quality about the definition of the DTFT that would limit the way you apply it to an actual signal? Anybody have a reasonable answer for this? This, this is a tough one. Yeah, absolutely. That's sort of where it falls apart. Right? You, need a, you need to be able to specify all the points. Right? So if you look at when I'm using freak z here, I'm putting all, I'm putting all the points for my function into freak z. Right? But what if you had an infinite, what if you're listening to a telephone conversation, right? and you've just got, you know, for all intents and purposes, an infinite sequence, right? How do you take, how do you look at the frequency contents of that signal? That's where the DTFT falls apart. Um, so how, how do we deal with that? Any guess? Not that we, not that it was in the book, but just applying a little bit of intuition. Here you are, you're an engineer, right? You've been given an hour worth of telephone conversation to analyze. And you have to look at its frequency content. So go ahead. What do you mean narrow the band? But you still have an essentially an infinite string of samples, right? If I give you 10 million samples of data, I, mean, I guess you could put all 10 million samples. But let's say even better, you're listening to an ongoing telephone conversation. You have no idea when it's going to end, right? So now I've sort of posed a problem that your H, your your you have and the number of points is essentially infinite. So you can't really, if you actually want to you know, pull the crank and get, get your DTFT to turn out a number, you can't have an infinite number of samples because you'll have to wait forever. But you're thinking in the frequency domain. Right, I'm thinking in the time domain. Right, what is the definition for the DTFT? It's h of e to the j omega equals the sum from n equals 0 to n minus 1. So you have n points of h of n e to the minus j omega n. Now, it turns out that Omega, by definition, can only go from minus pi to pi, as we talked about. But n, right, what if you have 10 million, you know, what if, what if capital N equals 
you know, 10 million, right? You're going to crank all 10 million numbers of there in there? What if you don't know what N is, right? What if you have to wait for the phone call to hang up? You know, it, it could be 10 million, it could be 10 billion. Um, any thoughts on how we might handle that? All right, now we're getting somewhere. So you essentially make it a dis make it a finite sequence. How do you do that from a mathematical point of view? All right, that's getting there. Um, so the way I like to think about this is you've got some sequence H, right, which, which we're going to assume for just now that H is infinite, right? So now I want to make it discrete. I want to, sorry, finite. I want to make it a finite length. So I want to pass it through a function that makes it finite. What might that function do? Exactly. I'm going to multiply it by a pulse. Right? So it's zero everywhere except for it will equal one at certain values. So now you're taking, let's say you have a sequence that's 10 billion samples long. You're going to multiply that by another sequence that is all zeros except three of its values are one. So now essentially you've just picked off three samples. And then you can take the discrete Fourier transform of that. And that's how we do it. What effects do you think? So, um, what effects? If you multiply in the frequency domain, what do you do in the? Sorry, if you multiply in the time domain, what do you do in the frequency domain? Exactly. Right. Right. So this is. So we're going to call this h of n times our window. In the frequency domain, we're going to take h of e to the j, h of e to the j omega, and we're going to convolve it with whatever the DTFT is of the window function. Okay, so moral of the story is, is that can you make the DTFT work with a infinite sequence? Yes, you have to multiply it by a window, but there's a penalty to be paid. And we're, this is something we're going to discuss more later. It just seems like a nice time to make a, an introduction to it. The penalty that's to be paid is that you're no longer going to be looking at just the frequency content of that signal, but you're going to be looking at the frequency content of the signal convolved with the frequency of the wind, the frequency content of the window, and I'll leave it at that. We'll, you know, we'll probably spend a whole day just talking about wh what kind of a mess that creates, right, and, and how we get around that mess. But just to think about it, that that there is a solution, okay, to, to that limitation. Um, any questions? And certainly, feel free to jump in. I'm, I want to keep this. Very casual. Um, don't forget that I, everything I write down here, including all these notes, all, all the MATLAB code, that'll all be on Blackboard tomorrow. So, you know, if you're not keeping up, don't worry about it. And if I have any luck, I'll put the video online as well. I want to show you another snippet of code that I like. So let's close that. Yep, these are all going online. They're not there yet, but I'll put them there tomorrow. Okay, so this is a little something I played with. Um, let me start by writing the, the formula down before we kind of jump to the, the, the MATLAB. So we know that the we know what the definition is of the um, of the Fourier transform. Where is it? Um, let's try this. Copy. Very good. Right, we're showing off now. Eight, four, five. Good. Okay. 
factor in that case. So here's my definition of the Fourier transform. The cool thing is now you can take the inverse Fourier transform. So there's a formula for that in the book, and you know I think they derive it. I'm really not too interested in how they derive it, but for whatever it's worth, the formula works like this. Take your discrete time Fourier transform and multiply it by e to the j omega n. Integrate it over the interval omega is minus pi to pi, divided by 2 pi, and you got your function back. So I actually want, tried to see if we could do this in MATLAB. I thought it would be instructive to see how that would work. So let's take a look at the code and see if we can actually get the reverse to work. So let me just close all my plots. Um, close. Let's try to neaten up the thing a bit. All right. So here's my moving average filter. Okay, so it's 1, 1, 1 divided by 3. And I'm going to define it over um, this frequency, this range of omega. So from minus pi to pi, spaced out by a value of d omega that I picked more or less arbitrarily. And then I'm going to compute the H, right? The Fourier transform. So that's everything, you know, that's that's stuff that we've looked at so far, right? That's that's nothing fancy there. Um, so let me just run that real quick. And now I should be able to plot the frequency content. So plot um, omega over pi, comma, after value of H. Alright. So as predicted, the moving average filter is a low pass filter. So in other words, if we start at zero, we can see that we're passing the low frequencies, and then after that, you know, the higher frequencies more or less get rejected. So that's good. So now I'm going to try to apply the inverse GTFT, just to see if I can do it in MATLAB, you know, for no other good reason. All right, so the way I'm going to do that, I'm, I'm going to apply the the DTFT is best, I, the inverse formula as best I can. So you recall that what we did was is we were integrating over the interval from minus pi to pi, h times e to the j omega n. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I want to take the inverse transform for these three values of n. Right? We know that the original function was n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equal the third of each of those values. So here, um, I'm going to say, OK, let's start with n equals 0 and just plug in the formula. So here's e to the j omega n times h, right? It's a, it's a DTFT. I'm going to sum it over all the values. So that's like my integral times d omega divided by 2 pi. All I did is strictly apply the formula. And then each value of, so that each, every time I do that, that will give me the first time I do that, that will give me an, an estimate for h of 0, and then h of 1, and then h, h of 2. Right? And I happen to store that in a variable called s. So let's see if it works. Um, so um, so that's a good question. Why, why was nvec equal 0 to 2? So my original signal looked like this. OK. All I'm doing is specifying, when I d define this n vec, right, all I'm doing is defining at, at which values of n I'll be taking my inverse. Exactly. I'm just. I, I could also actually. What I'll do afterwards. I'll also ask it to to give me the inverse uh, Fourier transform at negative one and at three, and hopefully those should come out to zero. But for now, let's just try start with the you know the bare bones case. All right. So Matt. Oops. MATLAB uh, editor. All right. So let's give that a run. Um, ah, all right. So 
the red is my original, right? The red is the original one third, one third, one third, and then fairly imperceptibly behind that, you can see that there you have the blue is the reconstructed. That's what I got from applying my formula, and you can see that it's almost like right there. It's almost perfect. You can barely see the blue underneath the red, so it's pretty good. So here's a question: If I wanted to get a more accurate estimate of h of my of my function, what, what should I do differently? Good. Does everyone understand what what Das said? If I wanted a better estimate of h, what could I change? The answer is is the only thing so. The theory tells us that for the most, for the, for a perfect reconstruction, you take an integral, right? Which means that you're, you're essentially summing over an infinite number of omegas. Unfortunately, MATLAB can't do that. It can only sum over just a finite number of omegas. But obviously, the more you give it, the better, at, the more accurate your result will be. So actually, what I could do, I could make this, um, I could reduce. Um, I could reduce d omega and see if I get a worse result. Right, it's going to be harder to tell if it was a better result, but we can make it a worse um, estimate and see what we get. Okay. All right. So now it's a now it's a pretty pretty cruddy estimate. It's still not a bad estimate considering we only used essentially six values of um, of the Fourier transforms to reinterpolate for our original signal. So I thought that was kind of cool. But you can go backwards and forwards. Let me do one other change to this. So instead of instead of just doing 0, 1, and 2, what if we try to do negative 1, negative 2, 3, and 4 as well? Right? So in other words, it correctly predicted that those values were at a third. Do you think it will correctly predict that all the other values are 0 as well? So let's give that a shot. So n vec, let's say, goes from minus 2 to 4. And this is just a little hack so that it knows where to put the data. All right, let's give that a shot. Oh, it's not going to like this. Hold on just a minute. Um, uh, I'll have it only plot the reconstructed value. Okay, so not bad. Again, this is the lousy estimate, right? This is the estimate with, with d omega equals a half. So it's pretty good. It knew that the those values are approximately a third, and the other ones are approximately zero. And if I increase my d omega, sorry, if I decreased it, I'd be approaching more and more an integral, and eventually it would be more or less indistinguishable. So it's pretty cool. You can go back and forth with this in MATLAB. I want to show you one more thing, and then I'll get back to having more of a discussion. Actually, maybe we'll have a break after that. Um, the bus comes at what time? The shuttle bus? 8.13. Okay, so we have a little bit of time yet. Um, oh, right. I was showing you something cool. Um, All right, there's a lot of stuff here, and it's really not too important. But um, it, it's just to, to show, it's going to give me a segue into one of the other properties of these filters that we're going to wind up discussing. Um, so previous to this, everything we've looked at has had a denominator of 1. Okay. All those signals and all those filters come under a common heading, which we asked, I think I asked about. Yeah. The last question was, what's the difference between IIR and FIR filters? Does anyone have a handle on that? The, what's what? I couldn't have said it better myself. It's exactly right. So. 
maybe I'll just push the pencil for a minute and then we'll and then we'll do the example. So when it comes to signals, there's there's four filters, there's two basic flavors. It's, it's easier to think about this in terms of a filter. Um, there's FIR and IIR. And you so first of all, what do they stand for? One is finite impulse response. And the other is infinite impulse response. And they are what, you know, there's really no more to it than what the name says. So if I give you a filter whose impulse response is um, like the one we looked at before, is that an FIR or an IIR? Why is that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's got a finite length, right? So um, I think that's capital N equals two samples. So it's FIR. Cool. So that begs the question, okay, well, if I can write out a finite impulse response filter like this, how do I write out an infinite impulse response filter? I mean, do I write out the all infinite? <laughs> so, I'm sorry, the what? In form of a series. You could do that, but it doesn't necessarily always form a series. Right? I mean, some, some filters will sum to a series that you could reduce, but not necessarily. And that's where we get to what, to what Rajan said. Um, Rajan, right? Okay. Um, so, FIR filters have this property that the filter only acts on the input samples. So in other words, the filter that I've written here, a half a half, says your output is going to be a half times the present sample plus a half times the previous sample. That's what that means. IIR filters are different. The filter acts on both the input and previous values of the output. So what does that mean? For example, you could have a a filter that says, okay, the current sample is equal to, um, let's just say arbitrarily, a quarter of x of n plus a half of the previous value of x plus two-thirds of the previous value of y. Okay, this is, for example, you call it a difference equation. And you can see that the y is not only dependent on your input x, but it also depends on previous values of y. And that's where we get into this business with the numerator and the denominator. If I were to resort this, um, you, you could essentially write it as um, y of n minus two-thirds y of n minus 1 equals a quarter x of n plus a half x of n minus 1. And then in essence, all the coefficients of the x become your numerator, and all the coefficients of the y become your denominator. Yeah, right, exactly. So, so now we go back to MATLAB. I actually have no idea what this filter is going to do. Maybe we should just plug it into MATLAB as an example and, and see what it gives us. Okay, so 
you know, so the question is, how do you represent an infinite impulse response filter if, if you can't possibly show the infinite, the infinite impulse? The answer is, you don't represent it as an impulse. You represent it as this, as a, as a, as a fraction, new coefficients in the numerator and coefficients in the denominator. Okay, so let's give it a shot. Um, omega equals zero to pi over a thousand to pi. So that should give me a thousand points. Oh, 1,001, because I got 0 as well. All right, and so now I'm going to say h equals freak z. So my numerator will be a quarter and a half. So a quarter and a half. Now, in the past, when I was dealing with finite impulse responses, I put 1 to my denominator. But now it's no longer 1. Now it's the coefficient for y, which is 1, and the coefficient for y of n minus 1, which is negative 2 thirds. So let's put that in and see what happens. So 1 and negative 2 thirds. And I specify what values of omega it gets um, evaluated over. OK, didn't burst into flame. That's good. So plot. Uh, omega over pi comma absolute value of h. Looks like we have a low pass filter. All right, it's a infinite impulse response low pass filter, as opposed to what we looked at before, which was a finite impulse response low pass filter. All right, but that's how you represent it, and that's what that one was before that we were just kind of sweeping under the rug. So a finite impulse response versus infinite impulse response. All right, does anyone guess where we're going with this now? We're going to take its inverse now, right? Before, we took a finite impulse response, took its DTFT, and then we took its inverse, and we found that its inverse was an accurate representation of that original finite signal. Well, there's no, I want to try to do the same thing now with, this DTFT. With the DTFT, there's no reason why I can't plug it into the same function. So um, let's just see what we get. Um, so I'm actually going to abandon this example and go back to my inverse DTFT from before. Uh, let me just I'm gonna save it. Uh, that's not what I wanted. File, save as my DTFT2. OK, so first thing I need to do is define my signal, um, which we said was, what was it, a quarter, a half, one, negative two thirds. So now, over what values of n? Let's go crazy. Let's go all the way from negative 10 to 40. And that's it. The formula stays exactly the same, right? I'm still using you know, my summation of the integral. I would like, though, however, to improve on my value of t omega so I get a nice um, representation. And that should do the job. It's going to take a while to run. OK, and there you have it. So it turns out that after some point, the response is effectively 0. But it's actually never zero. I think it's one of those things where it's asymptotic, where they get smaller and smaller, but they never actually reach zero. You can't really tell that in a plot, but the point being that you can take, you can get an estimate of an inverse discrete time Fourier transform, even of, a, even of an infinite impulse response. Does that make sense? Am I looking at blank stares or people following? Yes, sir. That's correct. Well, that's the thing. We don't know. Because I was unable to, when I'm dealing with an infinite impulse response, I didn't define the filter with the original sequence. I defined it with the difference equation. So I actually never knew what this was going to look like. Um, for this particular filter, now I could, we could do another example of an infinite impulse response filter where we know ahead of time 
what this is going to look like. Um, but for this particular random example that I cooked together, I don't think there was any way of knowing ahead of time that I don't know that it would be even possible to predict that this would be the outcome unless you just do it purely numerically with MATLAB. Does that follow? Let me ask one question. Um, in some cases, in some cases, you can work through the math and you can go backwards, but not in all cases. I think you can especially do it when you have an infinite series that sums to something like you were suggesting before. Um, so the typical example, and the one that you'll see in the book, is the example that you see in the book is the infinite sequence um, h of n equals let's say um, doesn't matter what the number is so let's say one half to the n where n is greater than or equal to zero so here's here's an infinite impulse response sequence that you can actually represent you can actually write a formula for this. So you would expect the first term to be 1, and then the second term to be oops, a half, and the next one to be a quarter, right? and on and on and on. Getting closer and closer to 0, but never actually getting there. Um, in a case like this, it is possible to actually do the difference equation, get a closed form expression for the Fourier transform, and then to plot it. So this is this is an example of an inverse of an infinite impulse response that you can plug into MATLAB, get the inverse and compare it against exactly what you know it should be. But I think that's only because this sums this does a when you sum the infinite series it sums to, to a certain value. Whereas I think that other one that we sort of arbitrarily made up doesn't work that way. Um, just a quick question, and then I think. Yeah, it's got to converge. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly right. Let me just po pose one last question, and then we'll we'll take our break. Um, oops, I want to do this. Um, so here I have this comment here. Why must we select this range of omega for the inverse DTFT? Right, why couldn't I have selected? Instead of minus pi to pi, why couldn't I have selected zero to pi? That's kind of a cool question. I like that one. You might want to look at your definition of the inverse Fourier transform. Let's see if we can find it. There we go. The answer is on this page somewhere. What's that? Yeah, it's just the definition of the integral. The definition for the inverse discrete time Fourier transform obliges you to integrate from minus pi to pi. So when you come over here, while you – go ahead. No, actually – no, that will work. You could do it that way. Oh, I like that. That's a good. So the question was, instead of going from minus pi to pi, it looks like I may have been a bit. I may have jumped the gun a bit quickly. So the question is, could we have said this? All right. Will this work? I think this will work. Yeah. It. Right. Exactly. As long as you sum, as long as you have any continuous range of of two pi, that should work. Let's give that a, a, a whirl and see what happens. Cool. Okay. So it worked. All right. So I'm wrong. <laughs> so 
it has to be something to something plus 2 pi. Um, what you couldn't do for sure is right exactly 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 you you could just as well have done um you know 1.4 right to 1.4 plus 2 pi All right, i mean what is that that's kind of arbitrary but um it's going to produce the same thing what you can't do you can't do this Right. I mean, this will give you an answer, but it won't mean anything. I'm sort of curious. This one actually doesn't look that different. Okay, well, we might have just gotten lucky. Does it look, look, does look different? Okay. Right. suitably do some uh, the value right exactly you are still capturing it's not going to be exactly I, I totally agree yeah I mean you, there's definitely you're definitely exploiting a lot of the symmetry um, in order that even if you don't pick the right frequencies, it's still going to get a reasonable approximation. But I, that's just dumb luck. I mean, I think we could very easily be working with a different sequence where this wouldn't be the case. Um, okay, why don't we just take a five-minute break, just because otherwise people will go nuts, um, and then we'll come back and answer whatever we haven't answered yet. Although we're getting pretty close to answering all my questions. And then we might have to answer your questions. Let's see how I turn this off.